Um, okay, uh, we'll come back to the uh, part uh, C, uh, which is the last part of this chapter. <clears throat> I know part B, uh, understanding accounts receivable is a lot of work, but once you get it, it's actually really simple. It's just um, at most the two to three journal entries, right? But the, uh, the nitty bits, bolds, and um, you know, uh, it's needed practice. So, and then with that being said, I wanted to tell you accounting is actually a language, right? And then when, if you want to uh, speak the language fluently, what do you do? You practice. Practice, 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 make you uh, able to understand this uh, uh, major or science better. Okay. So part C. Part C, honestly, uh, we already covered a little bit in chapter three, I think, and then chapter two. So let me share the screen with you. Okay. Okay. So part, part C, we talk about notes receivables, okay, and the interest. Uh, notes receivable is almost similar as accounts receivable, but it's more formal. It's a formal credit instrument. Uh, may, it means that the, 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 the people that you offer credit to, right, or you, you lending money to, or you uh, wait them to pay you back. So the money that you, you lend, that person, that person needed to write, a, this is a person, okay, write a formal contract with you. Uh, with you. And since you are the one receiving the money, as we call it note receivable, okay? And then when you have a formal contract, that the contract is to have an interest rate and signature and stuff, hence that you will have an interest revenue, okay? Okay, let's do a quick example, a simple example illustration. So similar to a country receivable, but including a written debt agreement or note, okay? No more debit balance, okay? Uh, so therefore, note receivable is also has a normally a debit side balance. Classified as either current or non-current asset. If the note receivable is more than one year old, uh, when it's due, due date, so if you borrow money to uh, David for more than one year, then this note receivable is going to be considered as a non-current asset, right? Uh, but if you borrow the money for uh, David for, say, within three months, then this note receivable will be considered as a current asset. And then that's why it's dependent on the uh, due dates. So what are, uh, what's the component of a note receivable? First of all, on that piece of paper, you have a following ingredient. First, you need to have a face value of how much money that person owe you. And then uh, uh, when is this contract being signed? <clears throat> and you have to say when it's due, six months, one year, 10 year, after date, I, which is the guy who owe you money, promise to pay to the order of this company, say if you are uh, Susquehanna University or say Jiehao LLC or Lovely Cafe or uh, Amazon. So this person who borrow you money is I here, right? You are the lender. You are the ones holding this is the contract. You have a right to ask him to pay your money. King Z lend money to outside people. Pay E, okay? 10,000 pay E is King Z, okay? So for 10,000 and no $100, right? So basically uh, $10,000 uh, sharp, not nothing else after that for value received with interest rate at 12%. And then this person, I, stands for Justin Penn, right? Okay, hence that face value, due date, six months, pay E, it's King C, 
interest rate twelve percent maker is adjusting. So this ingredient you got to have to be able to call it a formal credit instrument. Okay. So Kinsey provided a ten thousand dollar service to Justin Payne, who is not able to pay immediately. Justin Payne signed a promissory note offering to pay ten thousand dollar plus twelve percent interest rate within six months. Okay. So what do we do? On February 1st, when Justin signed this the pros, promissory notes with debit notes receivable and credit service revenue for 10000 Okay. And the note interest is reported on the day of initiation of notes receivable. Notes receivable are similar to accounts receivable, except that notes receivable are bearing interest or formal credit arrangement made within a written debt instrument or note. Okay, so after six months, that's the time that Kinsey collecting full principal of ten thousand plus the interest rate that Justin, uh, interest that Justin promised to pay. So how much the interest is? Remember. It's a ten thousand dollar at twelve percent annual rate, but it's only a, a borrow for six months, so it's a six out of twelve, right? So that's give us a six hundred dollar interest revenue. So therefore, on August first, which is the due date of this note, we definitely record the credit interest revenue for six hundred, and then we will credit notes receivable because. This note is not outstanding anymore because Justin pay us on that day. And we definitely debit cash for principal plus interest, right? Which is 10,600, just simple like that. Okay, so now we wanted to see what if uh, the, the notes received were caught in the middle of closing the book. So oh, oh again, <laughs> closing book again. Okay, you will you will get that, right? Did I say on chapter three? You will get there. That, there you go. This is another place that uh, you need to draw the line for closing entry, uh, not closing, uh, adjusting entry. I'm sorry, adjusting entry on the year end. Okay, so what if a six months note was accepted on November first and due on May first, right? So there you go. You get caught in the middle. You need to close the book, you need adjusting stuff on December 31st. So therefore, by December 31st, you only had a two months of interest revenue for 200. How did I get there? There you go. And then the rest of the four months is actually going to another accounting period, right? So therefore, in, in December 2021, we debit interest receivable because we are not going to get paid until here no cash no money no cash received until may 1st 2022 right hence that by december 31st 2021 we understand that we have interest revenue for 200 but we know we did not receive it hence that we're creating a account for the interest receivable right receivable has all kind of receivable, accounts receivable, interest receivable, tax receivable, uh, uh, you know, uh, notes receivable. So now you can debit, happily debit the uh, interest receivable. And how did we calculate that 200? On this, 10,000 multiple 12% is two months. Why is two months? November 1st to uh, December 1st, December 1st to uh, January 1st, which is two months, right? Okay, on May 1st, May 1st, 2021, the maturity date, Kenzie collecting note of 10,000 and the $600 of uh, uh, interest in total. So what do we do? We, of course, we recognize the 400, right? The four months from January 1st to May 1st, the four months of the interest revenue. And also we're gonna reduce the interest revenue, the interest revenue, uh, the 200 already recognized that revenue last year, right? But the receivable, we need to reduce it because we're going to collect in cash now. At the same time, we're going to collect the principal of 10,000. 
rent we're going to credit the interest receivable and crediting interest revenue for that four 400 crediting and receivable that was creating last year because we are getting paid every penny of the interest which is 600 therefore we reduce receivable by crediting and also we reduce notes receivable by crediting the principal amount okay so let's see a company accepts a note receivable for five thousand a dollar on september 1st that matures in 10 months and has an interest rate of six percent i want to tell you as long as it's an interest rate of six percent we assume it's an annual interest rate what amount of interest revenue will the company report in 2021 and 2022? So September 1st to December 31st is how many months? The 12 minus 9 plus 1 is 4 months, right? And then uh, from, <clears throat> so 2022, this is, this is 2021, this is 2021. From January 20, January 1st, 2022 to another four, six months is going to be uh, July 1st, 2022 is this six months, right? Okay, so, <clears throat> so for interest revenue, we were recorded in 2021, we will uh, record four months of interest revenue by using the five thousand dollar multiple six percent dividing twelve, which is each month how much interest it is, and multiple four, right? Which gives us uh, one hundred dollar. And then in 2022, we will record, uh, it says uh, 10 months, we will record the leftover 10 months in total. So there's a six months of interest to go. Right? So 5,000 multiple 6 percent dividing 12 multiple 6 is equals 150, right? Because Right? So therefore, we choose eight. Okay. Calculating key ratio investors use to monitor companies effective with managing receivables. In other words, if the receivables is the stand outstanding too long, outstanding receivable, meaning that uh, meaning a uh, customer have have not paid yet, have not paid the company yet. In other words, a lot of assets that's supposed to become a cash is not, is not transferred yet. It's not, it's not collected yet. Uh, the risk is that we might lose it, right? We might incur too many bad debts because the more you waited the customer to pay you or the customer waiting to pay you, the less likely you get paid. Hence that the, the, uh, whether you can uh, convert the accounts receivable into cash, it tells a lot about the, the management ability, the company's effectiveness and production effectiveness, right? So therefore, the faster the accounts receivable become cash, the better, right? You don't want that a lot of people owe you too much money for too long because the more the longer it is, the less likely you're gonna get collect those cash. Hence, we wanted to use a ratio to analysis this. The so we call it the first one we call the receivable turnover ratio. The receivable turnover ratio shows the number of times during a year the average accounts receivable balance is collected. So turnover, right? Uh, the net in the net credit sale refers to credit sales, right? So receivable turnover ratio equals net credit sale. Remember, uh, it's equals the total sales minus the sales 
allowances and sales discount and minus uh, um, sales returns, right? So how much the net revenue you collected from the customer you waiting to collect it from the customer? The amount of net sales obtained from current period's income statements, right? Average accounts receivable equal to the average of accounts receivable reported. And then also remember that the uh, average accounts receivable is the, uh, this is numerator, the denominator is average accounts receivable. How do we get there? We use the beginning accounts receivable plus ending accounts receivable and dividing to get the average of accounts receivable. And then we can calculate how quick the receivables are turned over to cash over the year, over one year, okay? How fast you uh, are able to collect in your accounts receivable. And then we have another thing called the average collection period. It's a, the, the definition is the number of days the average accounts receivable is outstanding. We, we use the 350 days dividing the receivable turnover ratio. What does this mean is that the, the <clears throat> how many days that each piece of each $1 or each uh, a client that you owe, owe you money, we're holding it outstanding. Like how, how many days you can able to collecting accounts receivable for, from your client within a year. Of course, the more frequent the business is able to turn over their receivables, the more effective the company at granting credit and collecting cash, right? The average collection period shows that, this one, shows that approximately the number of days the average accounts receivable balance is outstanding. So let's see, we're comparing uh, these two uh, health company hospitals, Tenet and LifePoint. So if they have a receivable uh, turnover ratio for 5.6 means that healthcare, tenant and healthcare turned over the accounts receivable faster uh, than the uh, uh, life point hospital, right? Because the uh, credit cell dividing the average accounts receivable is 5.6, and then they use the 365 dividing the, the accounts receivable ratio, they got a 65 days. So on uh, average, ten and the hospital, ten and the healthcare, the so patients are uh, 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 holding the the hospital bill doesn't pay until sixty five days. This is our average, but the life point hospital patient pay the hospital eighty five days after their surgery, right? So that means that the ten and the healthcare is relatively better. Uh, because they have a higher receivable turnovers and a shorter collection period, right? This is almost means a collection, this is a collection period. And more effectively to collecting their, their bills, uh, their uh, outstanding bills, so more efficient collecting cash, right? Okay, the receivable turnover ratio and average collection period can provide an indication of management ability to collecting cash from customer in a timely manner. Okay, which one, which of the following would it be true for a company that has accounts receivable turnover of 10? So accounts receivable turnover 10, if we say collection period, it would be 365 divided by 10, it's gonna be 36.5 days to collecting a bill, right? Right, so the company turnover their uh, asset receivable more than once a month. Uh, which would, uh, no, it's more than 10 times or equals 10 times, right? They turn over their accounts receivable to cash 10 times a month. And the, uh, the, the company would have an average collection period of uh, 36.5 days. That's right, that's what we're collecting here. And uh, a company would be considered as doing an efficient job of collecting receivable if the terms were net 30. No, actually, uh, I, I don't think uh, Net 30 is a some kind of certain kind of benchmark to judge whether uh, the company is doing uh, the collection job well. Okay, it's just a term that you are given to your credit, your customer. 
the customer, the company would have an average collection of 20 days. No, it's actually 36.5 days because collection day, average collection day, there's a formula, the 365 dividing the uh, accounts receivable turnover ratio, which you can get 36.5 days. Okay. Okay, so estimating, so the last one, which is appendix that I just want to quickly introduce you is to estimating on collectible accounts using percent of credit sale method instead of uh, percentage uh, of accounts receivable method, right? What we call the allowance method. Um, so basically, uh, when you uh, when you use a percentage of credit sale method, you are actually using income statement method because you are multiple the percentage of uncollectible on the sales amount instead of percentage of uncollectible rate uh, on the accounts receivable. Uh, because when you multiple accounts receivable, which is a balance sheet account, we call the balance sheet method. When you multiply the percentage of uncollectibleness with the sales or the revenue or the revenue amount, we call it the income statement method. Okay. And adjusting allowance for uncollectible accounts for current year credit sales that we do not expect to pay. So the methodology is exactly the same. We are debiting the bad expense, bad debt expense immediately when we have a credit sale and will credit the allowance account. It's just the percentage is the multiple the sales instead of accounts receivable. Okay, so then there's a, a comparison, the balance sheet method and the income statement method. Income, uh, balance sheet method means that the percentage of receivable, multiple accounts receivable, and the income statement is the percentage of a credit sale, which is the revenue, right? So, as, so let's say estimation on collectible accounts, 20% of accounts receivable at the end of 2022 will not be collected. So let's say the accounts receivable at the end of the 2022 is 30 million. Hence that we get the number of 6 million will be uncollectible, right? And adjusting allowance count from 2 million to existing balance uh, 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 2 million existing balance to six, then that means we will only debit the four, four million on the bad debt expense and credit the uncollectible for uncollectible accounts, allowance for uncollectible accounts for four million. On the other hand, if we say we are benchmark against the credit sale, meaning that we consider 10% of credit sale in 2022 will not be collected. And if we, we made a credit sale for 8 million, that means 10% of 80 million will be 8 million of bad debt. And we will ignore or we will ignore the 2 million existing balance on the allowance account and adding 8 million directly. So we will not need to back out and say, okay, 6 million in total minus 2 is 4. There's no such calculation here saying, uh, 8 million minus 2 is a 6. There's no such calculation. What directly recognize 10% of every penny of the credit sale, the revenue amount, is, is recorded at bad debt expenses. Okay, so that's 8 million. So on the income, on the income statement, as you can see, the revenue is 80 million and the bad debt expenses only hit 4% because we use a receivable percentage of the receivable method. So we have a net income of 76. And on the balance sheet of uh, percentage of our receivable method is that we have allowances of 6%, which is two plus four, which is, uh, I think, 20% uh, of 30, right? But on, uh, based on the percentage of credit sales side, we have a revenue of 80 and we multiple 10%. We believe 10% of every sale, every penny of the sale will not collectible, hence that we record the bad debt expense of 8 million. And therefore our net income is only 72, okay? And uh, the allowance account, accounts receivable account is, we had already 
uh, previous unadjusted balance for two plus eight, we got 10, 10 million of uh, allowances. Hence our net account receivable is 20. Okay, let's see the concept check. On December 31st, before adjusting entry, the company reported the following balances. Accounts receivable of 100,000, allowance for uncollectible accounts is 2,000 on the credit side. The credit sale is 500,000. The company estimated bad debt to be 4% of credit sale, so the adjusting entry will include. Okay, if we are talking about a percentage of credit sale, we directly <clears throat> record the, the bad debt expense. and credit allowances for uncollectible accounts directly use the 4% multiple every penny of this credit sale, right? Which is 27. Right, hence we choose D. Okay, so we are at the end of our chapter five. I just wanted to give you a quick review of what happened. First of all, we needed to understand what is net uh, sales or net revenue, right? And the, the and uh, we know uh, <clears throat> there is a trade discount, which is to reduce the sales price. And there are also sales return and sales, uh, disc uh, sales uh, allowances and sales discount. And all these three is kind of reduction of revenue or sales account. As the net sale is equals sales minus all the three ingredient right minus the uh, sales discount and minus sales allowances minus the sales return that's the first uh, part second part we talk about uh, how to record uncollected uncollectible accounts receivable uh we use allowance method Right, and which we call it the balance sheet of balance sheet method. So, in another word, we in the year one that generating accounts receivable revenue, we already estimate percentage of uncollectibleness based on accounts receivable balance. So then we were debiting bad debt expense and crediting allowance uh, of uncollectible account, okay? So when we, in the year two, when there is the actual, the customer did not pay, failed to pay, we only record a debit, uh, uh, allowance, we write off the account, we call the write off by allowance of uncollectible account and credit account receivable. And at the, year, at the end of year two, we re-estimating this journal again. Okay, so this is second part. And the second part, actually, we we kind of talk a little bit about aging and which is just a one way of estimating the bad debt expense, right? So it's, it's pretty straightforward once you get a hand of it. So we, we talk about the aging method, we find a different bucket for different uh, <clears throat> category or a group of the uh, accounts receivable. And then the older the accounts receivable is, the, the lower likelihood for collection, right? So that's aging is, is just a method to estimate a bad debt expense. 
And then we compared direct write-off versus allowance method. And remember, allowance method is approved by gap and right, direct write-off is not a good idea, right? The third uh, component we talk about is actually note receivable, which is uh, interest-bearing. Interest-bearing means that that piece of paper, no, not only you lending money to other people, you are charging them interest. And then we understand how to record interest receivable and credit interest revenue when there's December 31st, which this is chapter three uh, content we, we train again, we, 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 eat, we eliterate it again. And the last thing is we wanted to calculate the accounts receivable turnover ratio to understand, to be able to compare different firms how efficiently they collecting their outstanding accounts receivable, how, how fast they turning accounts receivable into cash. That's it. That's actually the, mo the, the simplification, the bone of this chapter. And if you have any questions, don't worry. Don't feel uh, really stressed because uh, as you will see in the, um, in the classroom, we will have a lot of the exercise and that way you can uh, uh, get a better understanding of what I really need to focus on. Okay, so thank you and see you in next lecture.